Good evening and welcome to the presentation of the University of Michigan's Wallenberg Medal. My name is John Godfrey and I have the privilege of chairing the Wallenberg Executive Committee of this university. An important reminder that if you have questions for our medalists this evening, be sure to write it on one of the cards that have been distributed and pass it along to the usher because I know that the question and answer period is going to be very important and lively. On Saturday, November 21st in 1931, the University of Michigan defeated the University of Minnesota 6-0 to at a football game before a crowd of 37,000 people, winning the 22nd competition for the Little Brown Jug. That evening, in his room at a boarding house on Madison Street, Raoul Wallenberg composed his first letter home since arriving in Ann Arbor barely two months earlier. Describing settling into his life as a new architecture student at the university, he wrote, I read the New York Times every day and find that it covers all of my interests. It's the best paper I've ever read and considered the best in the country. The Christian Science Monitor is the next best. It will not publish scandals and it will not publish rumors. I also get Affairs Verden, which is Sweden's uh, weekly business magazine. Wallenberg does not mention the game, nor Michigan Stadium, which stands not far from where he typed his letter, and, had and the stadium had only opened four years earlier. A few months later, in another letter, he explained his morning routine. My alarm wakes me up at 7 a.m. when I rapidly get dressed and go to the Michigan Union, where I eat breakfast, consisting of coffee, with or without toast. It costs five and respectively five and 12 cents. My habits are as regular as an old man's. On the way to lunch, I pick up the New York Times, which I order at the drugstore. Wallenberg devoured news about the extraordinary events taking place in the world. His grandfather sent bundles of newspapers, including Sweden's leading newspaper, Dagens Nyheter. His letters home include brisk commentary on events in Europe and the United States. In July, following his freshman year, he writes about listening day and night to the radio broadcasts of the Democratic National Convention in which Franklin Delano Roosevelt pledged a new deal for the American people. And like most students, Wallenberg also read the Michigan Daily, likely over his toss, toast and coffee at the Union. The Daily appeared seven days a week, printed on between eight and 16 full-size broadsheets with university, local, and state news, as well as Newswire articles about events across the US and around the world. The daily printed stories about the Japanese invasion of northeastern China in 1931 and the attack on Shanghai in 1932. It covered the speech by Winston Churchill here in Hill Auditorium in 1932 in that same year. It shared news about Gandhi's fast to win concessions from the British Raj over the discriminatory treatment of India's Dalits, or untouchables. It printed articles about the rise of the Nazi party, the naming of Adolf Hitler as chancellor of Germany, the Reichstag fire, and other deeply worrying events. The Daily also covered campus talks and debates about Stalin's Soviet Union and events in Germany, including a talk in March 1933 by Rabbi Bernard Heller, director of Michigan Hillel, who warned of a dark future for German Jews and called for raising immigration quotas for refugees. But not all of the world's most significant news made it to the pages of the Daily. On March 29, 1933, an article appeared in the Manchester Guardian and the New York Evening Post, written by a young and intrepid Welshman named Gareth Jones, who spoke Russian and Ukrainian and aspired for a career as a foreign correspondent. His first-hand account described eluding Soviet authorities to slip into the Ukraine. He discovered empty villages, he witnessed death from starvation in the fields and on the streets, and saw the unrolling of a massive famine that had been kept hidden from the world. His report momentarily filled the news wires until the following day, it was slapped down with authority by the renowned Walter Durante, the New York Times' Pulitzer Prize winning special correspondent in Moscow, who brutally dismissed Jones's first hand account. 
Durante wrote, it appeared that Jones had made a 40 mile walk through villages in the neighborhood of Kharkov and had found conditions sad. I have made exhaustive inquiries about this alleged famine situation. I have inquired in Soviet commissariats and in foreign embassies with their network of councils. And I have tabulated information from Britons working as specialists and from my personal connections, Russian and foreign. There is a serious food shortage. There is no actual starvation or deaths from starvation. But what Jones bore witness to was the truth of what has come to be known as the Holodomor, a famine of historic dimensions, which, driven by Stalin's policies to uproot peasant farmers and break the spirit of the Ukraine, killed as many as 10 million people. We can assume that Wallenberg read Durante's deceitful apology for Stalin, perhaps over breakfast in the Michigan Union. Did he also read the reporting of Gareth Jones? Wallenberg's insatiable desire to read and learn as much as possible about the world around him that was gyrating toward cataclysm and his ability to do so in several languages makes a safe bet that he did. How might this have informed the person who he was becoming while here at Michigan? And what, did he, what he did 10 years later in the city of Budapest? We can't know. Confronting the truth of the Holocaust, his life slipped away and he vanished from the world's view for decades. In April 1945, the New York Times, on a page with stories about the horrors of Buchenwald, published an article about the adventures of someone else young and intrepid, a Swede who led the rescue, <clears throat> I apologize, who led the rescue of 20,000 Hungarian Jews and then disappeared after the Soviet army occupied the city. The story notes that he had studied architecture at the University of Michigan. Tonight, in this, his beloved university, we honor his memory <clears throat> and again recognize those who courageously stand with Raoul Wallenberg. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Mark Schlissel, president of the University of Michigan, who will introduce Safa Al Ahmad, the 27th recipient of the Wallenberg Medal. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, John, for that kind and, and really very thoughtful uh, introductory set of comments. Uh, it's really an honor to be here to present the 27th Wallenberg Medal to tonight's uh, distinguished honoree. I thank the members of the Wallenberg Committee and all those who established it and now carry forward the proud Wallenberg legacy at the University of Michigan. This event is a very special part of the university year because it celebrates the values we hold so dear. Our commitment to working to improve society, to promoting peace, to seeking justice, and to striving for positive change in our world. These are the values our alumnus, Raoul Wallenberg, exemplified in his own life. More than 70 years after his death, he inspires us by what he accomplished and continues to serve as a reminder that one person can make a difference in the world. Thanks to the generosity of many people here this evening who believe in the power of Wallenberg's legacy to inspire, our university is proud to award the Wallenberg Medal. And in honoring Raoul Wallenberg, we also advance the potential for our students to learn and grow through exceptional learning opportunities outside the classroom. The Wallenberg Fellows and Summer Travel Awards enable students to pursue an area of study or service in locations throughout the world. I encourage you to read about these amazing students in your program. Individuals who have contributed to the Wallenberg Endowment over the last three decades have made these extraordinary opportunities possible. We applaud your generosity and your vision recognizing the importance of these types of engaged learning experiences, so thank you. As I look at the list of the past 26 Wallenberg Medal recipients, I'm struck by the breadth of focus in the world. Our first recipient, Elie Wiesel, was a Holocaust survivor who spent his life advocating for peace and human rights. Subsequent recipients dedicated their lives to fighting apartheid, advancing nonviolent solutions to problems, bringing environmental issues to the forefront, 
promoting civil rights, and battling genocide. Some are working to bring issues to light like sex trafficking. Others are ensuring that children who are refugees or forced into labor can attend school. Last year's recipients were teenagers. They were determined to make the world and their schools and neighborhoods safer by tackling gun violence. What an inspiring list. Tonight's recipient, the 27th, at one point realized she had to make peace with death if she was to continue her work. A journalist and filmmaker, Safa al Ahmad, was determined to make sure the rest of the world understood what was happening in her part of the world. In 2014, a populist uprising was taking place in Saudi Arabia's eastern province. The government was repressing all reporting. Al Ahmad wanted to tell the story, to let the outside hear from the protesters and from the people in the street. The result was a moving BBC piece, Saudi's Secret Uprising. She followed this with a report for PBS on the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Just two weeks after the Houthis took over the capital of Yemen, Sana'a, she entered the city and began filming the fight for Yemen. Other films continued to spotlight the Middle East, particularly Saudi Arabia and Yemen, giving voice to the protesters and those caught in the crisis. In recording a young boy who says he has not been to school in months, she reports that education is extinct in Yemen. In Taiz, once the cultural heart of Yemen, there is no electricity, minimal water, and strict control by the Houthis. Getting water each day for the family falls to the children, some of whom lose their life in the process. Her work seeks to clarify in an objective way the complicated factions at war and the interests they are fighting over. To find the truth, she travels and works in the most dangerous situations. There are car rides in the dead of night to areas controlled by protesters, trips on foot across mountain passes, and visits to families in areas of cities decimated by mortar fire. All serve to expose what is happening in a place where the government would prefer that we don't see what's going on. Born and raised in Saudi Arabia, Al Ahmad has been reporting on Yemen since 2010. In 2015, she received the Index on Censorship Freedom of Expression Award for journalists. She was awarded the Association for International Broadcasting Award, recognizing her as one of the few journalists reporting for Western news organizations from inside the area, even as the government worked to prevent media from reporting. She's attached a face and a voice to the toll these conflicts have taken, particularly on those whose lives have been most affected, often transforming their existence from being busy city dwellers to becoming urban scavengers, seeking the barest necessities of life. Like all great journalists, she is a champion of the people. I'm honored to present the 27th Wallenberg Medal to Safa Al Ahmad. Thank you, Safa, for your bravery and your determination you truly epitomize the ideal of making a difference with your own life. Please come on up. Thank you. So uh, in a tactic to not cry today on a podium, uh, I'm going to attempt by telling you a funny story, or at least funny to me. Um, last year, I was commissioned to do a film in Yemen uh, that didn't just focus on the Saudi coalition, but actually the unspoken role of the American government in Yemen. And so I went to this tiny little village called Yakla. And if anybody here remembers, Yakla is the town that 
Trump decided to prove that he's tough on terrorism and send a special ops team to this tiny little village uh, where he alleged that there were Al-Qaeda leadership there. And as per the villagers, they killed about 30 civilians. So when I was there, this was not part of the film because it wasn't on camera, um, I went with the driver and I told him, I want to go film the drone strikes. So after the first raid, they continued, the American government continued to raid the city and this village specifically for a year after. Um, so he's like, no problem, plenty of options, plenty of cars droned around the road. And so he's like, but can we just pass by and I want to say hi to my mother. Like, of course, uh, because most of these young men who escort me into the village actually live in the cities and they don't see their family for months. Uh, so we get in the car, we pile in, and it was me, my producer, the driver, and this young man. And we go to see his mother and they say hi, and his dad was there. And she gets into the car, the father gets into the car. I don't know how many kids piled into the car as well. <laughs> Right? And I'm sitting there going, I think we're going somewhere dangerous, but they would know. So I, I didn't say anything, and we're all squeezed in together. And uh, uh, <laughs> she, the, his, his mother like, talks a thousand words a minute, right? And I'm sitting there going, I'm trying to focus, and I'm trying to be all professional. I was like, I'm trying to do this film, and uh, this family is coming into the car, and I can barely move because I'm like in the corner, because we're all like stuck together. And uh, uh, bless her, Miss Ida, she was like, I couldn't even keep up to, with what she was saying. And I was getting really anxious and a little bit angry, I must say, and annoyed that it, my, my film trip is turning into a family picnic, right? And so <laughs> um, they, uh, we, we drive like for 10 minutes into this area and there are two uh, droned cars on both sides of the road. And I get out, my producer gets out and we start filming the wreckage that's there, and it's a really, I mean, to, to see a droned car is really something, because they pulverize everybody that's in it. And so, uh, sorry, I'm gonna be graphic, but like you can even see burnt flesh and hair still stuck to the ceiling of the car and the seats, and it's really an intense scene. So I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm trying to film, and in my frame is a motorbike and the motorbike had two teenage kids on it, two boys, and they had blasting jihadi anashid. And that's usually a bad sign. Uh, so I was like, I don't know, I won't be judgmental, maybe they just like the music. Uh, and so I was like, let's wrap this up, and we get back into the car, and the motorbike goes ahead of us, and they stop, and they stop the car from going forward, and they get out, and they have AK-47s, which is, which is not unusual. I mean, uh, men are uh, armed in Yemen. It's not a, an unusual scene. And uh, they knock on the window, and the father and uh, one of the little girls is in the front, and he's like, you brought the kuffar to come film? How much did they pay you? And they start getting really very aggressive with the old man at the front. And the old man is really confused. It's like, what are you? who are you, <laughs> right? And he's, and he's like, right, do you have to question us for being here? Our sheikh sent us here. And so the old man is saying sheikh, using the word for a tribal leader uh, of, of the area, right? And the other, the teenage boy is like, my sheikh is the one who's gonna judge whether you have the right to be here. And he's using the word as meaning the religious uh, authority, right? And so they're both using the same word, meaning completely different things, and they're getting angrier and angrier at each other. And we're sitting in the back, and I'm too afraid to film. And uh, Miss Ada, bless her, she gets out of the car. Everybody's like really worried that somebody's going to start shooting uh, the, uh, the other guy. So she gets out of the car. She apparently recognizes one of the teenage boys. She holds on to his arm, and he's like, She's like, I'm going to tell your mother. <laughs> right? and me and my producer were like, Miss Ada, for the love of God, like, don't get them angry. Because obviously at that point, their terminology, their language indicated that they're actually ISIS and not even Al-Qaeda because of the, the, the intricacies of the, the area. It turns out that, bless him, this young man, had driven us right into a triangle. Just to explain a little 
of how complex this war is. This triangle is where the Houthis, the, uh, the Yemeni government, the tribes, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS are all fighting each other in this little triangle that they thought it would be fine to have a family picnic in. <laughs> um, and so uh, Miss Ada holds on to his arm and she's like, I'm not letting go. Right? The other young man is not from the area. She only knows the other guy. And the other guy starts getting angrier and angrier and more aggressive and he starts picking up his, uh, his gun. And I was f for sure that they're either going to kill us or they're going to attempt to kidnap us and get, and, and, and get back up. And Ms. Ida wouldn't let it go. Right? And she let, refused to have the men get out of the car. She locked the door. She's like, nobody's getting out. She's, and she's just pointing aggressively at this teenage boy with the gun. And she's like, you're going to let us go. Shame on you, right? And the guy was so, like, can you imagine this em em embarrassed teenage boy, right? Going, oh my God, she's going to tell my mom. <laughs> and he, so he's so embarrassed that he finally convinces the other guy to let us go, right? And during all this time, me and my producer are sitting there, and uh, obviously, we take out our, sim uh, our uh, memory cards of the camera. We're trying to preserve what we filmed. And we're switching around. And we're like trying to casually say to my editor, we might be kidnapped, right? Like, let, let, don't, don't panic, but you know. And my producer, uh, Rowan, uh, who's uh, Yemeni, uh, British, bless her, she, she whispers to me, it's like, we'll be OK together. We'll be fine. So, we were fine, right? And Miss Ada, happy with herself, uh, gets back into the car, closes the door, says, let's go, opens her bag, <laughs> takes out an orange lollipop, and starts sucking at it <laughs> as we move on, right? <laughs> she, like, I say this is funny, I mean, this is scary, but also hilarious because Miss Ida saved our lives. Um, and I actually owe so many Yemenis my life on every assignment, almost every day, a Yemeni steps up to save my life, right? And in making these films, I think to me, the true acts of courage are of those who decide to entrust their stories to me, right? that they decide to share, to relive, what are some of the worst moments of their lives. The funny story didn't work. Um, <laughs> and this weighs heavily on me. I rarely walk away from making a film and feel like I've done them justice. Their stories haunt me. Stories like Asma, if you watched my Taz film, a five-year-old girl who died alone. Because she stood in line trying to get water. That's her only crime. I wonder if I'll die like that. Or Um Ahmed, after a strike in Sa'da, her two boys were playing outside. She hears missile, and she goes out looking for her kids. And she tells me that the only thing she could find is a tiny little earlobe. And she puts it in a napkin and puts it in her pocket. So, 
this metal also weighs heavily on me because of the people that have received it before. Um, truly, this is an imposter syndrome. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I, I was joking with the committee. I, st I still fully uh, expect them going, oh, you're Safal Ahmed, sorry, wrong person. Uh, <laughs> we meant to give it to someone else. Um, this legacy is daunting, and I truly don't feel I, I deserve it. This, These kind of awards, I have conflicting feelings about them because on one end, um, they're useful because they drive a conversation forward. They force people to talk about Yemen, and to listen to stories about Yemen, that their suffering is not invisible, that people are listening and, and curious and know. I mean, this audience proves to me that people still care and want to hear. But on the other side, this past year, has been horrible. It's, it's humbling to see the limitations of your own work. I feel, I feel my failure quite acutely. Everything feels more urgent, more painful. How ineffectual the work actually is in stopping this war, stopping the horrors of this war, the impunity of the, all the warring parties, especially Saudi Arabia, but also the US, the hubris, the arrogance. We keep saying never again, yet we keep doing it. I wake up, thank I, I wake up every day angry. I don't know what to do with this anger. Which brings me to another form of courage I must acknowledge. My commissioning editors who, in front line in the BBC, continue to have the courage to commission stories on Yemen, even though everybody says nobody gives a shit about him, right? Nobody even knows where Yemen is. Why do we need to do a story about Yemen? How is that related to an American audience? How do we justify X, Y, and Z about Yemen, right? Yet, every time they commission it, they send me because they believe in it. And I must, I must say without, I mean, journalists can be as courageous as they want, right? But if they don't actually get commissioned to be sent, if, if an organization doesn't see the importance of telling that story, then they die. And finally, I want to talk about your courage. You're turning up here today is evidence that people still care, right? That you also have courage and have not turned away. I know a lot of people, it's much easier to just turn away and not, not hear these stories, not want to feel like you're complicit in the war crimes that are committed in your name, right? So hopefully you can also find a way to hold the cowards who are perpetuating these war crimes account, right? Today's an election year. Please go vote, vote for the right people. Ha tell people that this is not something that can continue. Thank you. Thank you.
courageous. <laughs> so, this is the part of our program where we get to ask questions and get to open up a conversation. And if you have questions that uh, you'd like to pose to Safa about her work, uh, please write them down and uh, Kaya will go around and collect them and uh, we'll uh, start the conversation. Um, Safa, I, a question here. I'd like to uh, start with this one because it's such an obvious one. Uh, how did you become a journalist? By accident. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like I've been saying this so, uh, so many times to this week. Uh, I started off being an activist. The, the first thing I did when I left Saudi Arabia is uh, wanting to be engaged, wanting to be critical and be active and uh, connect with other people and do all the things I couldn't do when I was in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, quite quickly, I realized the limitations of being an activist here uh, because I was at the time, and it tells my age, uh, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, and I felt like even if we got millions of people out in the streets, our governments continue to ignore us. Um, and part of the challenge was to get journalists to come cover us, but cover us with nuance, cover us without just saying, how many individuals came out in a protest and how many streets they filled or if we shut down the city or not. Like, the logistics of it rather than the heart of why these things are happening. And uh, so I felt maybe it would be better if I became a journalist. And I told my stories and I told the stories that I thought were the gaps in between of telling our stories in the Middle East um, that I felt uh, weren't represented both in, in both, so I'm not just in the Western media, in Arab media as well. We have terrible media in the, in the Middle East, and they're mostly controlled by either Saudi Arabia or Qatar. And so they are controlling the narrative as well in our own language. And so we are lost in between trying to find ourselves finding representation in any of these outlets. So I became one. <laughs> here's, here's another question. Um, you uh, have entered into... Uh, societies that I suppose can be aptly described as being highly patriarchal. Mm -hmm. And um, could you describe, talk a little bit about how being a woman affected your, uh, the ways you navigate these situations mm -hmm. and the strategies that you used to get to the stories that needed to be told? Can I just point out that misogyny is global and it's not special to the Middle East. Um, I, I think some people like you know, they're being smug about it. But in reality, we're all, re I mean, we're still talking about the pay gap here, right? So, but in, in actuality, joking aside, the reality is that most of the best journalists on the Middle East right now are women. To me, being a woman in the Middle East covering these stories is a superpower. I have the ability to not only access all the men and their stories, but I also have the ability to access all the women's stories as well. Um, I easily uh, go into people's homes that men, even if they're Arab, cannot easily walk into. Um, I have access to, to them in a way because they understand, I understand them, I understand if she's not wearing her hijab, I'm not going to film her. I, un I understand the cultural sensitivities, I understand, right? And she doesn't need to explain things to me um, if, uh, as in if it was a foreigner, right? And so to me, all of this is an asset. Um, even wearing the, uh, the, the hijab and the burqa even uh, is amazing because then you can pass by checkpoints, you look like a civilian like anyone else, they don't search your bags. Um, and so I, I see no downside to this, honestly. <laughs> I feel bad for the men, but I mean, no competition. So, so following up on that in a, in a way, um, you've described how your... Um, some of your extraordinary interpersonal encounters. Uh, in, the, in the situation where there has been uh, so much war and so much distrust, how do you get people to trust you and to speak to you about the, the kinds of uh, the personal stories and the personal tragedies that you've described? I think uh, 
two, two things are happening with uh, when people decide how to talk to a journalist, right? There is one, there is the desire to tell your story and you want to be heard and you want to be seen, right? And then, then there are also the immediate accusations she must be a spy, uh, which is a go-to in the Middle East. It's quite easy. Everybody gets accused of being a spy. Uh, I'll give you an example. When I was filming in Saudi, uh, I had maxed a guy uh, to do an interview and then I walked away from him and I was doing some B-roll and filming some you know, palm trees and stuff, but he didn't realize I could still hear him. And so he was talking to another guy. I was like, yeah, she's probably a spy. She, she, the Ministry of uh, Interior probably sent her. But he continued to talk to me, right? Because I think genuinely people want to be heard. And when, I think people know when somebody's being sincere, when they, they are, don't have a political agenda and how they want to tell a story. Um, I think people get that, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, and sometimes it just takes longer. You can't, you have to, I take weeks meeting people and talking to them, drinking a lot of tea um, to, to make them understand. And, and I think in, in a way I, it's really strange because you have to open up as well, right? Like if you require this per, for you to open up to me, I have to open up as well. I have to be as vulnerable almost, right? And that's a delicate boundary situation, but ultimately they, they have to feel that you have a stake in this as well. Here's a question. You have uh, spoken about, uh, I think rightfully so, about how little the West knows about or cares about Yemen, understands it. Could you talk to us a little about, about your experience of how well the Yemenis understand and know the rest of the, the wider world? I think Yemenis are super aware. I mean, like, uh, the diaspora, the Yemeni diaspora is everywhere. And so, uh, yeah, they're very aware. They're a lot more aware than Americans are about their own country. Um, and, and so it, I think the Middle East is, in general is hyper aware of the West because the impact of the West on the region is quite present. It's, it's not a, t a, you know, a theoretical conversation over, uh, over coffee. This, these are real implications, right, of how the U.S. foreign policy, we, uh, in, in the Middle East, everybody follows the presidential elections, right? Because, I mean, the joke is we should have a right to vote in the American elections because we, <laughs> we have to deal with it as well. Uh, so, yeah, no, uh, they are very aware, yeah. And how um, could you describe, is there a, a press that exists inside of Yemen today in this, in the middle of the today. war? Today, yes. Uh, well, I would say there used to be amazing, vibrant, uh, diverse uh, uh, journalism in, uh, in Yemen. So there, the, the, like, similar to what's in Lebanon, because of the different political parties all have licenses. So all the political parties have their newspapers and TV channels and radios. And so there was not a singular narrative. It's not like in Saudi Arabia, the Ministry of Interior controls how things are, uh, are printed. In Yemen, it's a lot more diverse. I mean, and the, and the political situation was uh, not as oppressive, even during Ali Abdullah Saleh time. Uh, all of that has been decimated with this war, both by the Houthis, who've taken over uh, main newspapers, shut them down or controlled them completely, and, and now they have their own uh, channel in Masira, and even in the South, arguably even harder, because neither the Saudis nor the Emiratis, who are part of this coalition, uh, have any respect for journalists, obviously. Um, and uh, all the militias also don't want uh, true journalism, and so this is the only reason why I'm still on Facebook, because this is my Yemeni newspaper. All my friends who are journalists now post their articles uh, on Facebook. This is, this is how we know what's going on, right? We have some fresh questions. How does the US policy, the US pulling out of Syria, how do you think it, the impact it's going to have on the rest of the region? On Syria? Uh, on Syria yes. or, the re or the rest of the region? How, uh, yes, with the U.S. pull out of Syria, what will do, do you anticipate might be the, the impact or impacts on the wider region? I mean, the, the, the bigger question is, is how predictable is Trump in any of his foreign policy or how thoughtful he is about anything? Uh, so I, I, I'm not a specialist in Syria, but what I can say is everybody is quite mystified about, uh, especially 
their behavior in, inside Syria. What's more interesting to me than what, what Trump decides or doesn't decide is what's happening in Lebanon and the protests in Lebanon right now, what's happening in the protests in Iraq, what's happening in the protests in Iran, what's already happened in the protests in, in Sudan and Algeria, the, the elections in, uh, in Tunis. I, uh, uh, I don't usually say this, but those are the most optimistic things about the region, right? where I, I think we have had enough. We've had enough with American involvement. We've had enough with Iranian involvement. We've had enough with all the old guard and leadership. And I, I am, I'm, I'm quite curious how all of it, um, it pans out, honestly. But I, I, I think American influence in the region, and because of Trump, I think will uh, accidentally free, free us from worrying constantly about how America is going to see and how America is going to do and what America is going to send. Um, so it might be quite refreshing. I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> I'm cautiously optimistic. So here's, here's another question about the, uh, the, con the current politics in the region. Uh, you mentioned in your talk about the uh, hubris and the arrogance of the warring parties and you specified Saudi Arabia and the U.S. And how do you, um, how, does this criticism extend to other parties in the region, uh, specifically Iran? Sorry, what, what, the uh, Iran, criticism how, of involvement? Of, of, no, of the arrogance and hubris to be, in, of, of, uh, to be involved. Uh, you specified Saudi and U.S. hubris, but uh, how do you see Iran in uh, their within role? Within the Yemeni context? Yes. Ah, yes. So, to me, the Iranian involvement uh, in Yemen is probably, arguably, the cheapest proxy war that they're involved with in, in the region. It's not the same level of involvement as in Syria or Iraq or, uh, or Lebanon even. Uh, the Houthis have a mind of their own. They quite clearly did that. There were allegations in the beginning that the Iranians clearly told them to go into Aden, and they still did. I mean, regardless of that, I think the, the reasoning for the Saudis, at least initially, is that because the Iranian-backed Houthi militias, mm -hmm. then we must go to war to protect our borders and stop the Iranian involvement. What actually happened is a self-fulfilling prophecy, where whatever tangible relationship the Iranians had with the Houthis initially is now a lot closer than they were before because they have no more friends. The Houthis, I mean. The Houthis are now closer to the Iranians because of it. And so, again, this is the disaster that is the war in Yemen on all levels. Why has the UN not addressed Yemen? Do you have any views I mean, of this? They, they have, what do you mean? It's they, a have, they have. So can you explain? I mean, they, they have, uh, they have uh, as the UN does, uh, they have many uh, <laughs> systems in place and monitors and uh, resolutions. Uh, the, the, the true issue is that I think unless the Saudis and the Emiratis decide that the war is going to stop, it's not going to stop. Right? The UN has not been able to do anything tangible really uh, in Syria, for example, or in Iraq, or any of that. So I, I, I don't think anybody's waiting for the UN to actually do anything because they are just a collective, right? So unless the warring parties themselves decide to stop the war, it's not going to stop. Have you had any experience with American soldiers in the region? And uh, what has that experience been like if you have? Uh, only vicariously through doing the, the, the story on so the impact of the special forces on, on Yemen. Um, I had a really difficult time getting the Pentagon to answer anything. They wouldn't give uh, interviews on the record. They barely even spoke to us off the record. Uh, and th this speaks to the hubris, right? They didn't even feel like they needed to answer to the number of civilian casualties that they inflicted in Yemen. Uh, it, 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 it was qu quite astounding. So I, I, you know, I refused to embed with American soldiers like in Iraq, like with some of the other uh, uh, journalists who were in Afghanistan. Uh, I don't do that. So I haven't interacted with them in that way, and I will never interact with them that way. I'm That's not interested in doing could, that. Maybe you could discuss the, what happened with the issue of the backpack. <laughs> yes. Uh, so in, in the last film, I went into the small village that wasn't Yakla, it was Adlan, and they had the largest 
uh, Special Ops uh, Forces 50 were sent to, uh, to Adlan because they claimed that they had uh, a very important high leadership of Al-Qaeda and they must do uh, uh, send boots to, uh, on the ground for this. And to compare 50, because in the Bin Laden mission, when they went to uh, uh, capture Bin Laden, I think there were about 13. So that's a significant number. Uh, what happened is that they withdrew what, what seems that something must have gone wrong because they withdrew quite quickly and they left a medical backpack behind. And this, I was filming with the, the, one of the families and they bring out this ba backpack and they open it and they start bringing out things from it, water bottles and what, and then two laminated papers. The laminated papers had 22 names, true full names of the special ops guys on the mission and their blood types. True, true names, right? And so you, you are claiming that this, uh, this uh, Al-Qaeda members are so dangerous that so you have to send these people in. Yet, you send a list with the true names of the special ops guys and the last two names are two dogs. Uh, will I be arrested if I say their names? Uh, so, the Pentagon were more interested in making sure that I blur all the names, including the two dogs, because they say that within the special ops, they consider them, they treat them like the humans and they get like special burials if they killed and I don't know. So I'm sitting here trying to get them to acknowledge that they've killed civilians and they worried about how to cover up for the list that they left behind with full true names. And I had done an interview with, with uh, somebody who used to be head of uh, uh, DOD and the CIA, but obviously he was from, um, uh, uh, Democrat and not Republican, because none of the Republicans would talk to me on the record either. Uh, and <laughs> I tell them, so is it uh, standard operating procedures to bring a list of full names of soldiers uh, uh, on a special ops mission? And he was like, no, right? And he's just like shocked, it's like, no, that, that never happened, that shouldn't happen. Like he couldn't even comprehend. And I'm like, but it was laminated. Right? And he burst out laughing <laughs> and he shakes his head, you know, like, oh, this is, I can't swear, right? Yeah, it's, <laughs> so it's, it to me is an indicator of like how careless they are. They, they don't even have their story straight about how dangerous. They, and they ended up killing five civilians. One was a 15 year old, one was 80 year olds old. Like what, what are you doing? What, what is this? It, it is beyond my comprehension really uh, of how, complete disregard for human life in this way, and not even admitting it afterwards, you know what I mean? Not, they're not even having the, the enough respect to communicate with the families. And all the families wanted is like, clear our names, you've killed our family members, and we're not Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. Because there are ramifications to this on the ground as well, that you're branding people as Al-Qaeda when they're not. Mm -hmm. But no. In your films, you have uh, you you show the uh, the presence of the the factions within Yemen, the myriad factions that are fighting um, soldiers from the U United Arab Emirates, uh, the Saudi presence certainly, and the American presence through their laminated list of names and the detritus of the destroyed <laughs> village. Uh, I mean, remember and, Trump with Baghdadi. Yeah. He's like, he declassified the picture of the dog that attacked the Baghdadi, <laughs> right? But he's like, I, I'm not going to tell you his name. It really is, I didn't realize how serious the name of the dog was. <laughs> um, there is there's a question here. In, in, in this conflict, is there an Israeli presence in any way? In Yemen? Yes. Uh, not boots on the ground that I'm aware of, but I, I, I've heard of... Obviously, the Saudis and the Emiratis buy a lot of technology from Israel. Um, I don't know if they bought any drones from them. Uh, I'm not aware of anything fully, but uh, it, they're not a significant player as far as I'm concerned. If, any, if anybody knows anything else, come tell me. You've done so much extraordinary work in a, an extraordinarily fractious part of the world and part of the Middle East. Do you, from your experience, do you see any uh, strategy for moving to broker peace in the region? And if so, how would that work? What form would it take? What do you think? I mean, this is mean? a speculative question. In general, like the whole yes, area? Yes, inside of Yemen, no. inside of Yemen to, to restore a balance, a, 
a peace in Yemen. That's a good question. So, um, last year, I went to this. I went to this small village. I, I mean, old women are the most eloquent people, and they like they're so concise. Uh, and uh, so, I was asking her the same thing. I was like, what, "What's the state of things here, and how things?" And she says, "خلاص إحنا لا قبيلة ولا دولة." Right? And in Arabic, so she's saying, we don't have a tribe anymore and we don't have a state anymore, right? And so everything is decimated. And so what she was trying to say is that the structures that used to be in place to fix things is no longer there. So they've destroyed the traditional ways of making peace between tribes. And they, he, uh, Ali Saleh has also destroyed the structure of the state that could also uh, take care of a citizenry. And so what is left now is this chaos of not really having the traditional tribal structures or uh, semi-tribal structures, depending on where you are. Um, and so now who, who's in control? Right? That, that's the problem now in Yemen. Who, even if you sign a peace agreement today, if Hadi, the so-called president, uh, signs an agreement today, right? if there are Yemenis in this room, you know how ridiculous that is and that. What realities, what power does he actually have on the ground? Who has the power on the ground, right? So some of the militias answer to the Saudis, some of the militias answer uh, to the Emiratis, some of the militias answer to themselves and their tribe. And so how, how are you gonna actually get any true peace that way? Um, uh, stop the funding, yeah? Uh, all of them are being funded by the different factions and they have their own outside sources of money. Uh, the true peace will come when it's no longer financially viable to, to continue making war. Because nobody cares about the civilians, obviously. Right. Thank you. A question. First of all, Shukran, how was your work received in Saudi Arabia? Are you safe there or accepted there? Is there an opposition in Saudi Arabia, as in Egypt, for example? Can we expect an Arab Spring? In Saudi? Saudi. Um, one, I have a problem with the term spring and winter because that's problematic. But I would call them the Arab uprisings and Saudi did have its own uprising. I did a film on it and it was historical. They continued for three years. Uh, what the Saudi government is brilliant in, in doing is uh, covering up stories, stopping people from actually covering it. When, the, uh, when it's not constantly in the news, then people don't, you know, are not even aware, uh, aware that something has happened. So that's already happened. So they're all either been killed, put in prison, or now in exile. Uh, I am, I'm the least optimistic about the future of Saudi Arabia. I'm more optimistic about what's happening in Iraq and uh, in Lebanon and stuff because the Saudi government has, because they're aware, the power of an individual, the courage of one individual to do something. Yeah? So all the individuals ha that have shown any sign of resistance to the general government narrative about Saudi Arabia is now in jail. Lejani al-Hadlul is in jail. Jamal is, God knows where his body is. Uh, Islam is in jail. Everybody, even, and the lawyers of the women who are activists for simple rights like driving or uh, uh, lifting the guardianship laws are also in jail. So you can't even be the lawyer of, uh, of an activist anymore without worrying about, about this. Um, so that, that situation, I'm not... Uh, so that connects to the, to the next question, which is given the things that you've had to sacrifice by leaving Saudi, what was the most pressing, the immediate pressing matter that made you take that decision that you could not be there? That I could not stay in Saudi Yes. Uh, they sent a letter. <laughs> so, there was no ambiguity about it. The, after the Saudi film came out, uh, the Saudi embassy in London sent an official letter to the BBC uh, numbering all my crimes as a Saudi citizen. Uh, they were very helpful. I, didn't, I wasn't aware of all the crimes. Uh, obviously, they don't understand the concept of journalism. Um, and they accused me of supporting terrorism because I interviewed uh, protesters. And they, in the letter, said I should have reported them to the police. Um, one of them is, actually, um, is dead. Uh, of the two I interviewed, uh, the other one ha uh, lives in exile now. Uh, so I am free to go back to Saudi Arabia. The question is, in what form would I leave? 
So um, how has your family reacted to your career? This is a more personal question. Mixed. <laughs> That's sufficient and understandable. I think we all have the same answer about <laughs> our own things in our own lives. <laughs> uh, let's just say I don't ask permission. Uh -huh. So, from the people you've met who have struggled through such terror and strife, how have you changed your outlook on how to live a fulfilling life? Um, the thing about covering conflict, it clarifies things, right? Um, you learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about people, you see the absolute worst and the absolute most amazing things, right? And so it's a really intense period. And with that intensity comes, there's so much relief, you hold on to so many things, right? And then you realize, actually doesn't matter. Uh, but especially this year, I've, uh, people who know me know that I'm not the most diplomatic person, uh, but I am more so now, as in I, I have less tolerance for people who, uh, um, who want to play games, who uh, want to not have a moral, uh, moral clarity about things. I don't care. I'm just going to say what I feel is my moral obligation to say. I think it's my responsibility to say, not in my name, you're not doing this, I'm not okay with this war, this is unacceptable, unethical. What happens, happens. I mean, you die once. So you, in many ways, you're a war correspondent, what used to be called a war correspondent. And uh, you have recorded uh, uh, you know, tremendous tragedies, personal tragedies, and tragedies within communities. Um, reflecting on your extensive work over the past decade, how would you, how in this situation would you, would you bring light to people's lives in a different way, in addition to these tragedies. You've described something about the orange lollipop in the car after the, the, your encounter in the triangle of death. Uh, but are, are there other humane circumstances that you've encountered while making your documentaries that lie apart from the, the, the horror, the tragedy that you must record? I mean, daily, right? Like. I think the, the, the challenge of being a filmmaker is uh, knowing when not to film. Right? Uh, because I'm invited into people's homes and I get to witness really intimate moments, you have to respect that sometimes you just do not take your camera out. Right? And, uh, and so, yeah, I, ha I have them all the time. It's, Yemen is amazing. I, I, I was just talking to a person just now about, like, I don't, how did we get here? How, how, how has Yemen gotten this bad? Um, it's so frightening how, how quickly it collapsed. And so, yeah, I, I have so many of these stories and uh, I, I think a lot about how to incorporate them. But the problem is if you have half an hour to tell everything, <laughs> you, know, you can't do it. And so you have, to, you have to think of prioritizing what is the information that an, an audience has to know. Uh, and so I keep them to myself. Uh, I'll figure out one way of, uh, of telling them one day. This, this might be, again, it might be a little bit difficult, but I'm wondering if you, uh, this person writes to say, could you say some words about Kamal Khashoggi and the Saudi Arabian role in his death? Uh, hmm. What? What do I say about Jamal? I mean, Jamal to me was contentious when he was alive uh, because he was vocally pro-war right, in his life. Uh, he only changed that stance uh, later on. Uh, 
And so he's one of those people you meet and it's impossible to, like he's such a sweetheart, right? Like <laughs> he's like this big teddy bear. He's, he's such an amazingly sweet person yet because of his position in the government um, and his proximity to it. He had a lot of problematic uh, stances, right? The thing is to remember now, regardless of anything he's done in his life, it does not justify his murder. And I think a lot of people in, who want to defend the Saudi government, they, 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 they like to talk about the minutia of his life as if that justifies anything, right? And so I feel it's my obligation to express my opposition to his stance against Yemen, for example, but in no way does that justify that you can chop someone up in a, in a, in a consulate and disappear him. Like even the chop, I, I don't actually, it, it's all leaks from the Turks that we, we think we know what happened. But in reality, we don't know because they have disappeared him. Yes. And that is the cruelest yes. of uh, fates for, uh, for yes. anyone, anybody who, who has... Uh, someone in their family who has been disappeared when you actually don't know, is this person alive? Should I mourn them? Should I fight for them? Is he in a basement somewhere in a prison in Saudi Arabia and we're, we're all moving on with our lives because we think they're dead? Like it's, it's the most traumatizing thing and I think they do this deliberately. They do this to scare the rest of us into silence. I think what's been it, what, one of the surprising things that happened after his death is that Yemen is now part of the conversation. You cannot talk about Jamal without talking about the war in Yemen. All the resolutions now in Congress have attached the two together. That conversation, uh, the irony of his death is now resulting in the pressure is now on to stop the war on Yemen. Um, and that to me is amazing. Uh, we as Saudis in exile abroad are, have also collectively made a lot of decisions that we wouldn't have made a year ago. And so you have had, um, and we can see in your films, uh, remarkable conversations where, uh, with individuals who have uh, probably never encountered a journalist before of any kind. And to see uh, a woman with a video camera um, coming and asking them very directly about their experience, uh, this must be a remarkable experience for these individuals. Um, it, and that kind of conversation has many aspects to it. It's an opportunity to reveal truth. It's an opportunity to, re to reveal a perspective on events that may or may not be true. It, 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 there's, there's many different features of that kind of conversation with a journalist. Do you believe that people begin, in some way at least, begin to heal after they've had a chance to speak with you about what they've been through? Oh my God, I hope so at least not traumatized more after <laughs> talking to me. Uh, there was a scene in the, in the BBC version, not the PBS version, of the latest film where uh, this, uh, uh, this kid, Mujahid, who had survived the raid, uh, is up on the hill and I'm filming him and his dad. And his dad decides for some reason to say, he points at me and he's like, she's American. And the little boy goes, where? <laughs> Right? It's like, here, she's American. It's like, no, where? And he's like so confused, like, where are the Americans? Because in his memory, it's the special ops guys that flew for, he came down from the sky and shot everything up and killed his uncle and his brothers, right? And so he was, he was so confused and he didn't realize that he met me, right? And then when he believed his dad, I was like, oh, okay, it's her. And he, he, start, he wants to throw a stone at me. I completely understand that instinct, right? Like, what, was that healing for the kids to meet me? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, but I think at least, at least you walk away feeling you've been heard, right? The problem for me is you're given this, you're given this story, right? And you try to do it justice, right? And then you go back, at least for me, you go back to London and you sit in this edit and you sit with these people who know nothing about the story, who've never met these people, who have not made any promises to them. You have none of these things, right? And you, 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 you try to keep it together, right? Like to me, it's more traumatizing 
to sit in the edit than to be in Yemen. And Yemen is it's amazing. I love it when I'm there, right? The true challenge emotionally for me is to push back with my editors fighting over every word, fighting over every scene uh, that can preserve the integrity of the people that I interviewed. It's, it, I'm not saying it, it like it, there is malice in this or anything, right? But I'm saying they have different views of how a story should be told, and I have very <laughs> clear idea of how I want to be telling the story. Uh, and and that, that, that struggle, that tension uh, to preserve those stories uh, is hard. And um, I fail all the time. So. Well, I don't think you fail. I think it hurts at times, but I don't think you fail. And we're really pleased and honored to have you here with us tonight. There are a stack of questions in front of me written many of them on scraps of paper, not our regulation size <laughs> file cards. Kaya? <laughs> that are testament, testament to, to uh, the ability you have to uh, incite conversation, discussion, and uh, revealing stories about who we are and what our present is about. Um, on behalf of the University of Michigan's Wallenberg Committee, I would really like to thank you and I also want to thank our American Sign Language translators who've done a noble job. This is Pam Stone and Lisa Freeman. They should not go unnamed. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us this evening. And uh, Safa will slowly try to make her way to the lobby if anybody has thank some questions that me. we couldn't pose. Thank you. Thank you.